Hello, everybody. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Zia Modi for our WinP Insights feature, the very first in a video format. Zia is the co-founder and managing partner at AZB and Partners and really doesn't need any introduction. She is one of the most trusted advisors for corporate India, an icon who has forged ahead and carved an immensely successful path for herself and a leader who has widened that path for those that have followed. We are proud to have Zia as an advisor to WinP. Hear from her as she talks to Srija Vasantam. Please tell us a bit about how AZB's culture has changed over the years and how has your job changed over time as its founder? So, you know, we started with a band of 12 lawyers, many of whom are still with me today. It's been over 20 plus years. And when we started, we were, we were just a startup. We were competing with the then traditional large firms like Crawford Bailey, Mullah, Kanga, all of whom had all the Fortune 500 clients in their roster. And we were just a gang of 12. Um, I think what we did do at that time was try to differentiate ourselves by being 24-7 by being up to date on every possible thing that could happen to uh, basically be working day and night to see which notification had come out when, not to miss a trick and to be accessible and available. I was told that earlier uh, clients would have to wait for a week for an appointment. That's no longer the case. But of course, we offered it in an hour, two hours. And a lot of our initial clients were foreigners. Uh, because I had studied and worked in America. And when India opened up, a lot of those friends and clients came visiting who were used to and demanded that level of responsiveness. So that's what we delivered at that time. And I was, uh, you know, in the trenches day in and day out uh, without respite. Now we are from 12, we are 450 lawyers. As you can imagine, that is changed the landscape somewhat. Uh, I still get into the trenches, but only for a very few uh, set of matters, which require either high level strategy or a deal is about to tank or there's a regulatory issue that's come out or a promoter is going nuts about yes or no, yes or no. And I have to de-risk or risk mitigate or give him the options and highlight whether the deal is a go or a no go. Right. Uh, but uh, now, obviously, it's far more institutional. We have over 100 partners. A lot of my time today is spent in managing the firm. When you were 12 people, all of us managed the firm. There's nothing to manage. We were all busy trying to do good work uh, and get more work. Uh, so I think much more managerial of a role than before. I still do a lot of client-related work. So I would say 25% is client-related. And the rest would be probably managerial. It shifts from month to month. Uh, but then again, I get involved in a lot of advocacy, which I never did before. Putting views across to the regulator, coming on to certain committees that I think I can add value or the committees think that I can add value. Uh, and uh, really grooming the future leadership of the firm. Please share with us your experiences and learnings from building a firm with a culture that supports a high proportion of women employees. So, you know, earlier it wasn't even a thought process. Anybody who was competent worked and uh, nobody really looked at them differently. But as you have more lawyers and as you have many more women and uh, many more women as partners, then my focus is a lot more now on how to retain our talent, right? Because I always say that if you have invested so much in a woman and given the firm uh, the ability to make her a brilliant lawyer, then how stupid can a firm be to let that woman go without understanding why and not doing everything you can to retain her? So I think being a woman myself, obviously I've gone through all the problems that young women go through. I've seen how it can play out. I've seen where a safety valve can help uh, for a certain period of time. Of course, being a woman, I think that uh, it is easier for women to come and chat with me 
about their problems or their asks or what they would like or what is bothering them or why they think that they will have to leave if this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen. And so I'm a great believer in bespoke solutions. One size doesn't fit all. What is a traumatic uh, situation for one woman may not be for the other and vice versa. And so I think listening to the young women and seeing that you're not being disinterested or deaf to what they're saying. Sometimes they exaggerate. Sometimes what they're saying is rubbish. A lot of times what they're saying is very, very practical and true. And so if leadership can provide practical solutions, that's what I think we try to do. What's your secret to building and maintaining strong client relationships over many decades? I think I just uh, enjoy my clients. I really like them. They become friends. They know I look out for them. I think about them. My other partners always laugh that you have all these weekend conversations with your clients. They must be thinking you're nuts. Uh, but I don't care. When I have client quiet time on the weekend and I'm thinking about them, I will call them. And it's a five-minute call, 10-minute call. But then I'm done with my conscience list as far as they are concerned. And I think that over the years, I've stayed connected. I've not just looked at them as business propositions. I have, uh, in some cases, uh, grown with them. And so their loyalty is very, very important to me such that I must reciprocate. And then you want to become, you know, like all good lawyers and professionals, trusted advisors uh, to your clients. They think of you more than a lawyer, your lawyer plus. And the plus is understanding exactly what are the points that only law does not address. So having a 360 degree approach, understanding when I say you can't do this, they'll come back and say, but listen, these are the issues. If I can't do this, this is the impact, that is the impact. And so then you re-go back and say, okay, if that's the impact and that's what he wants to do and these are my concerns, how do we try and marry them? How do we try and balance them? And so I think communication with the clients, having a decent amount of EQ, which partly comes from being a woman, and uh, communicate. Yeah. What are the key learnings from building a successful career in a profession which was male-dominated and in which most of the clients are still men? So, you know, when I was in New York, I never felt the difference when I worked there for five years. When I came back and came to court, obviously very male-dominated in terms of lawyers. And uh, I think that uh, I took my father's advice and just put my head down and struggled and worked hard and worked relentlessly just to make sure that nobody thought that I shortchanged anyone because I was a woman, uh, simply because the ecosystem didn't really give the opportunity. And, uh, you know, I was, we all grew up and we are who we are because of our formative years. And as I've always said, I have a very strong mother. She is a Baha'i by religion. I'm a Baha'i by religion. And one of our religious commandments, forget about, you know, principles, commandments, is that our prophet says that men and women are equal. And if men and women are equal, and that is the word of God, according to all Baha'is, then we never really felt discrimination in our homes. And I was one of four children, three boys. And I always felt that there was an equal opportunity, never a voice that had to be diluted simply because of gender. And then, of course, uh, fighting for being there and trying to make space for myself, along with my peers as a junior at the bar. And then later on, when I switched to corporate m &A in the traditional non-contentious transactional space. But gender diversity is still as much as an issue today as it was 100 years ago. What do you think policymakers should be focusing on to drive fundamental change in this? I don't think it's that bad. I think it's a little better. We have moved on in 100 years. I would, of course, draw the distinction between the cities and the villages. But I think that, you know, there are a lot of schemes the government puts out there for women 
we just don't know enough of them. We don't tap into them to understand what safety nets are available. At a, a corporate point of view, I think that two things. One is I think that middle managers especially should be given KRAs to prove why X percent of their workforce is not women. The minute you make it a KRA, there is a vested interest in performing the KRA. And so merit aside, which is obviously a given, I don't think we have women that are only stupid that are vying for that space. I think we have uh, brighter than bright uh, women who are there, but are simply not being noticed because of unconscious bias or just people don't focus. Once you make that a KRA, people focus. So that is one. The next is when you get more women leaders, uh, which will happen in course of time, those will drive an agenda that forces top down people to address the gender diversity issue and to make sure that in that con context, both at recruitment and retention, uh, the women are important and stay in the leader's mind such that then, you know, the, you get a middle bracket, a uh, nice little bulge of women then they will again, hopefully, support the women below them. And it will become a nice little pyramid so that a lot of uh, the women who got the opportunity while climbing up will remember that the youngsters have to be given the opportunity as well. The first female judge of the Supreme Court of India was appointed in 1989, 39 years after the court was instituted. Only seven more women have been appointed to the Supreme Court after that. And sadly, there has been no women Chief Justice of India to date. Yeah. Ruth Bader Ginsburg proved how strong female judges can lead to a progressive transformational judiciary. How can we improve the gender balance in Indian judiciary? I think in time. So firstly, I think that, you know, as we say, we drop out of the workplace, right? And so in order to stay there is first the challenge. So when I came back from India, the law degree was a marriage degree, right? You studied for three years while your parents found your husband, and that was it. But uh, if you look at how many judges get elevated who are women, I think if you have a smaller pool of women judges, naturally you'll have a smaller pool of judges that travel all the way to the Supreme Court. And that can be because of judges get transferred, women can't really uproot themselves from their family as much as a man can require his family to travel with him wherever he gets transferred. And again, I think that, you know, 48% of our women are subject to what we call the leaky pipeline. 48% of our women drop out of the workforce at one stage or the other. And that's a huge percentage, right? That has to affect people or women in the law legal profession. And therefore, there are just simply fewer women judges to travel that. I hope it will change. I think it should change. But let's see. Now we move on to the fun segment, Ask Me Anything with Zia. How do you unwind when you're not busy solving a crisis at a company? I watch some late TV night shows with my husband. What's one thing you could share with us that most people don't know about you, Zia? Good God, I have no idea. Everybody's asked me every little detail about me. But maybe people don't know that, you know, I come across as ruthless, but my, especially my female lawyers will tell you that some stage I become quite a softy when I shouldn't be. And uh, I think that uh, most people may guess it, but I get truly paranoid if there's anything that affects the letterhead of the firm. At this point, what are your three most favorite books? As I said, not much in terms of book reading, but I read my Baha'i books and then I read management articles, I read management books, a great uh, lover of all the McKinsey alerts that come out. But really, if you're asking me for novels, etc., the day just goes by and then I've crashed on my pillow before I can pick up a book. What's your favorite form of art, Zia, and why? So again, you know, nothing specific, but I love Raza. And uh, I love a young painter who's now become quite famous called Narayan. Does great horses. My husband is really the art connoisseur in the family. He picks out young artists who then tend to become uh, quite famous after 10, 15 years. 
but uh, eclectic, really, whatever pleases the eye. Not just any name for the namesake. We bought a lot of paintings 20 years ago where today we could not afford to buy them. Uh, but just, uh, I think, uh, a random collection, nothing specific. But if you ask me where the colors please me the most, it would be a Raza. Please name three women who inspired you the most in your life. I would say my mother, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, these would be the two. Definitely my heroes. Thanks for taking out time and sharing these wonderful insights with us, Zia. We really Pleasure. appreciate it and please stay safe. Thank you. All the best.